Um, so my name is Sal. I'm the development manager at Happy City. Um, and this session is going to be co-presented by me and Elizabeth Oliver, who is on the board of directors. Um, so the way that this session is going to work is I'm gonna give a little introductory presentation um, and then Elizabeth is going to explain the next part, which is going to be um, a little a little kind of group activity and then a couple of presentations. Um, so for my uh, presentation, we're going to be talking a little bit about the research and a little bit of the theory on interactions between uh, community organizations and municipal government. And then I'm going to talk very, very briefly about the role of the municipal government in Canada and in Newfoundland, which might be might be repetition for a lot of people, but I wanted to cover it just because everybody sort of comes from a different educational background and everybody, you know, went to school somewhere different and has different experiences with all this stuff. Um, and if you have any questions or comments along the way, you can uh, like raise your hand or honestly just like shout at me, um, that's fine. Um, a lot of the, the presentation is based a lot on academic research, which totally comes from, you know, its own world, which has its own biases, so if you totally disagree with something, I would like you to point that out too, that's also useful. Um, come on. No. <laughs> Alright, I might need someone to go change my slides for me. Thank you, Julia. Um, so I'm going to start with the definition of a community, which is obviously a very, uh, very complicated concept, and there's not one right definition. But primarily, you can look at geographic communities or social communities. So geographic communities are bound by shared space, like a neighborhood, and social communities are bound together by shared characteristics. Uh, you might look at, for instance, the LGBTQ plus community. Um, those definitions are really fuzzy and there's a lot of overlap. You might have, for instance, um, a community of newcomers in a city who are bound by the shared characteristic of being newcomers and also occupy the same geographic space. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is the difference between community development and community capacity development. So community development, um, often in the literature, is seen as a very sort of top-down, like the government decides the intervention and puts it on the community, not necessarily a lot of feedback going there, um, not necessarily a lot of personalization of the intervention. It's really just, you know, here you go, this is what we are doing to your community. Um, and then community capacity development sort of came uh, as a response to that, and it's a much more much more holistic approach. Um, and I'm going to go to the next slide, which has a little bit more about capacity development. So it has a focus on the structural forces which have led to certain communities being excluded from mainstream social and economic life, and it really emphasizes social capital, which is the resources contained within the network of people in that community and is focused on developing and leveraging those rather than a governmental intervention where you sort of put it on there. It's focused on the community members themselves developing their own solutions to their problems and taking on the project management aspects and the organizing and all of that on their own. Um, can I get the next, thank you. Um, but obviously those are kind of two sides of the spectrum, there's a lot in the middle, um, and this model, Armstrong's Ladder of Citizen Participation, was developed in 1969 um, by Sherry Armstrong, who is an American writer and um, policy analyst uh, who wrote a lot about participatory decision making and how communities can or should be involved in, uh, in decision making. Um, so the first kind of bottom rung of the ladder there is manipulation. Um, that's the use of public relations by the government to bring support to a policy that they've already decided on. Um, then after that, there's uh, what they call therapy, which is 
uh, the pathologization of certain groups, marginalized groups, um, and attempting to change those groups rather than address the system which created them. The third rung is informing, which is a one-way flow of information from the government to its citizens uh, and nothing kind of going back the other way. Uh, next up is consultation, which is maybe things like town hall meetings or answering surveys or some of the things people here might be familiar with as the city doing community engagement. Um, but according to Arnstein, it's not sufficient on its own if you're only sort of getting that information and nobody is really par participating in creating the project on their own. Um, the fifth rung is placation. That's when you get a limited degree of power that, for the citizens, which is often very tokenizing. Um, so it's maybe a really small amount of power or maybe the power is only accessible to certain members of the community whom the government has deemed like palatable or like good representatives of the community as a whole. Um, and then above that, the sixth throne is partnership. That's an agreement between government and citizens. Um, above that is delegated power. That's when the citizens hold a lot of decision-making power given to them by the government, more than what you would get from the kind of tokenizing power of placation. And then at the very top is citizen control, and that's when citizens have full ownership over the programs, where they are the decision makers, they're the ones who do all of the policy making themselves, and they get to decide to what degree the government can intervene. Um, so I wanna kind of pause here and see if anybody has any kind of initial thoughts about this. Any questions or comments? Um, when I see it, I kind of think, where like where do you want to be where can you always be is is there like a best rung to be on is it always feasible to be on a certain one are there rungs that you should never be on or things you things that you want to be on but maybe can't always And it's often very inefficient to have full citizen control. It takes a lot of time. Maybe if you need to respond very quickly to something. Um, and just add that, especially if it's all volunteer run. Yeah, very it's true. Hard to do these if, 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 like, it seems like having you know, like citizen control, but if you know everyone, is, if most people already have like day jobs, and right, you have the time to do it effectively. Yeah. And a lot of the people who have the time and money to dedicate to that volunteer aren't necessarily representative of the broader population. It's I, I think about the higher rungs often in terms of equity and like, is it fair that you're taking the marginalized members of society and then kind of making them respond, even though it is empowering, sort of giving them the responsibility of generating solutions to problems they didn't create. Does anyone else have anything to say about that? Yeah. Can you speak up a tiny bit? Yeah, municipal governments often, their primary source of revenue is property taxes, so that does also create a kind of incentive, a systemic incentive to not be accountable to certain groups of people, especially tenants. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I don't want to stay on this too long, so I think we're going to move on. Um, so, 
kind of with those concepts in mind, I want to look at a little bit of the research that has been done on community organizations and what makes them effective. Um, so obviously, I think not all neighborhood level advocacy has to be done um, by established neighborhood organizations. It can just be groups of citizens with common concerns and no formal kind of overarching organization. Um, but a lot of the literature that's been done is done on, on those organizations, which is probably just because they're easier to study and they're better documented. But I don't want anyone to feel discouraged if you're not part of an organization like that or if there isn't one in your community. I think that that's definitely not essential in doing better advocacy. Um, but the piece of research that I'm referencing up here uh, was done a few years ago in Los Angeles and uh, it looked at the relationship between the characteristics of certain neighborhood associations in the city and how that related to the outcomes that they were trying to achieve. Um, so I want to look at two outcomes with the first being solving issues within a neighborhood. Um, so there were two factors which this study found were related to that. The first one is internal organizational capacity, which is basically just a measure of how organized they are and can they run consistent meetings, can they recruit volunteers, can they define sort of specific goals and not be all over the place, do they sort of have all of those things under control. Uh, and then the second thing is external networking, which looked specifically at the number of times they reached out to either other community organizations or to government, including city councilors or city staff. Um, but just how good they were at creating and reinforcing that network and how often they were in communication. Um, and then the second factor that this study looked at, or the second outcome, was ability to advise the city, so in this case the city of Los Angeles, on city policies. Um, and they found a third characteristic was related here, and that's action attention congruence, which is basically um, how, how close or how well you can kind of generate a plan to address a specific issue. So rather than having a goal of like, we want to increase civic engagement in our neighborhood, they might have a goal like, we want a polling station in our neighborhood for the next municipal election. And then they would go and find out who to contact for that and kind of what steps need to be taken to get that done. But the ability to kind of form a specific plan and execute it. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so because external networking was such a big part of that, I want to look at it a little bit in more detail. I realize I think that the yellow is maybe a little hard to read for you guys. I apologize. It might have been a poor choice. Um, but this is a graph from the, uh, or a table from the Tamarack Institute that looked at, in the context of neighborhood advocacy, some of the benefits and drawbacks to reaching out to particular groups. Um, so the first group in that first column there is neighborhood residents um, who are what the Tamarack Institute calls context experts, which is basically just a word for people with lived experience um, who are obviously very important to center in any change that you want to make. Um, but there are a few drawbacks to, uh, there, maybe not drawbacks, maybe that's a bad word. There's definitely barriers that often community members, especially more marginalized community members, might have to getting involved in advocacy. So lack of time, lack of knowledge, not having access to or knowledge to use certain resources. Um, and that's something that can be difficult to overcome. Um, the next one is service organizations and providers. They might be able to offer specific tools, resources, knowledge. Um, that's what the Tamarack Institute calls content experts. Um, but there are also drawbacks. Um, uh, turf wars and resource competition is definitely something uh, which I have come across in the Newfoundland nonprofit sector, and I think a lot of people have, a lot of other people have as well, especially if it's you know organizations who might be going after the same grant money, they might not want to partner with you. Um, but uh, kind of on that topic, there was some research done in Baltimore in uh, 2004 
and they looked at specifically neighborhood associations again and found that in Baltimore there were a lot of neighborhood associations um, and they were all competing for the same pretty limited pool of resources um, and they were also there were a lot of disputes over whether a neighborhood was covered by this neighborhood association or that one but when they were all surveyed on the issues that they wanted to address there was a really high agreement between all of the associations on these are the problems. So sometimes, you know, I think, I think it depends, but sometimes it can be good to partner with an existing organization um, if there are ones that are appropriate and share your values and have disposable resources, which again, they might not. Um, but it's, it's tricky. It's a difficult thing to know if, if it's the right thing to do or not, um, but sometimes they are able to take on some of that overhead, and sometimes there aren't, and there are benefits and drawbacks. Um, and then the last one is city councilors or staff. Um, compared to the other two groups, often have more decision-making power, of course, and more funding, um, but the challenges might be often harder to get in contact, often less responsive, um, sometimes lack of collaboration. I also just want to say this is not St. John specifically, the Tamarack Institute is Canadian and it's based on kind of Canadian expertise, but they weren't looking at St. John specifically and I don't want to say that that applies to, you know, the city government or not. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Um, and then so kind of going from city council, I'm going to talk really quickly about um, about the role of the municipal government in Canada to make sure everybody is sort of on the same page for that. So the so like a lot of countries, we have multiple levels of government. We have federal and provincial and municipal and the roles of those are laid out in the Constitution. Um, so the question I have up here is who can tell me, who thinks they know what is a service that is provided by municipalities according to the Constitution? Anyone? There aren't any, correct. Next slide. I didn't get you, you're good. Um, yeah, so it only lays out federal and provincial and actually really only provincial. Um, and then the provinces dedicate certain responsibilities to municipalities. So it varies a lot by province. Um, but in Newfoundland, we have this little chart which shows who's responsible for what. Um, so we've got, I'm actually having trouble seeing it, but the provincial responsibilities are, what is that first one? We've got managing local elections, fire protection, urban streets, urban public transit, road system lighting, drinking water quality standards, water supply, sewers, storm drains, wastewater treatment, garbage removal and disposal, planning and zoning bylaws, property assessment, preparation, approval, and auditing of budgets, and economic development. And this actually gets even a little bit more complicated because the city of St. John's is governed by its own act and then is a little bit more complicated, but that's more than I'm going to get into right now. Um, so, that's basically the end of my con of my presentation. I'm gonna give a couple of takeaways that I want you to think about as we go into the next portion, which Elizabeth is going to take over. And I think I'm just gonna I think I'm gonna go through these. I think I'm just gonna leave them up on the screen and let people kind of think about them on their own as they go through the next portion. So I'm gonna pass it over to Elizabeth Oliver now. actually when it gets to be your turn. Um, we're going to divide you up into separate tables. Um, I think probably six. Um, maybe Sally if you can heads while we're talking. Um, we will be coming around and giving you a slip of paper and on the slip of paper you will be told that um, you're a group and the, the, what kind of group you are is Will be specified, um, and I mean, you might say that you were a group of school teachers. 
but it's not one of the ones that can be on the list, but that's, that's the kind of thing it will be. Um, and then you will be given a scenario, a problem to be solved, a challenge to be met, um, something that you can do to make the lives, for your lives and your neighbors' lives better. And you'll get to sit and talk about it and try and figure out what to do. While you're doing that, Sal and I will be circulating through the room. So if you have a question, need something clarified, whatever, just you know, flag one of us. Um, after a little bit, we'll be coming around with another slip of paper, which is basically a list of questions that, you know, have you considered these points? Um, some of the points will not apply to your particular scenario. Um, some will. Some of them you already have thought of, that's great. Others might be completely new to you. And then at the end, as we always do with these kinds of things, um, we will be asking you to get reports from your tables about your scenario and what you're doing. Traffic on the street is moderate, but pretty constant. 
because of the locations yeah, of the schools, children have to cross the street in the morning during rush hour, and 